But everyone agrees the tomb was empty. So the question is, did the disciples come and steal the body? Now, let's be real, that's the dumbest idea anyone's come up with to try and start a religion. Christianity is the foundation on which I build my life, and after being baptised last year, it's transformed the way I live. This Easter, I invite Ben Goddard, longtime friend and mentor, onto the podcast to take us through the history and relevance of Christianity in the modern world. Disney says, follow your heart, but Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. Disney says, you are the king of your life. Jesus says, no, I am. And that's an outrageous claim if it's not true. But if it is true, then we've got to ask, is he a good king? And is he a better king than I am? Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Extrospective Podcast with your host, Zach Villeneuve-Snell. Now, this episode is quite close to my heart. Those of you who don't know, I am a Christian and I recently got baptised around this time last year. And I decided the best way to open that conversation on the podcast, as I sort of explore more of these sorts of conversations moving forward, both for non-believers and believers, is to have on Ben Goddard, who is a long-term friend and mentor. And we actually recorded an episode back in October, but unfortunately for various reasons, it never ended up going out. So it's actually kind of fortuitous that through all this back and forth, we've ended up recording and sitting down right before Easter. So it's kind of a timely reminder and a summary uh, if you're curious as to everything that is going on within Christianity. If you're listening to this now as someone who has either been on the fence or entirely atheistic with no Christian influence growing up. And I think the conversation has something for everyone. So whether you are a complete atheist, you're on the fence and curious, or you would consider yourself a believer, I think this podcast goes into some interesting topics and discussions off the back of Ben's life story. Now it is of course grounded in Ben's story because that's what the podcast is about but I do think this podcast in particular does sprout off into real deep discussions on Christianity and I'm just asking questions that I have, my personal curiosities, and I hope that in doing so they're the sorts of things that people will have doubts or questions about uh, regarding faith. So I won't waffle on any longer, but what I will say is that if you're a Christian or even non-Christian listening to this and you think after listening that someone that you know could really benefit from hearing the information conveyed in this episode, then please do share it around on your stories in a group chat to a friend because this conversation is so important to me personally and I know there is so much value in it. And if you agree once you've listened to it, then yeah, all I'd ask is is a cheeky share. At the end of the podcast, after we finished recording, Ben also wanted this sort of, sort of 30 second excerpt to be put in, just to clarify some things up. But after this plays, we'll get straight into the beginning of the podcast. Normally, I presume in the podcast that, you know, you talk to people, you hear their stories, you hear what motivates them. And in this podcast, what I'm talking about is who I am. And because my faith is such a fundamental part of who I am, naturally, when I'm you know, even talking about things that happened in the past, I'm going to be talking about some theological concepts. So although we may end up having kind of just longer faith discussions in the podcast, it will be relevant to my life because these are the things which underpin my life. Okay, so let's delay it no longer. Ben, welcome to the podcast, my friend. How are you doing? I'm okay. I had a bit of a stressful morning, but I'm okay. Hopefully this podcast will be less stressful than your morning was. And hopefully for the listener, it can be really, really beneficial. And if you were to sum up who you are in one line, how would you do so? Christian nerd. Someone once said that my tagline should be Ben Goddard, short story long. So uh, I have a longer answer prepared. We'll delve into the Christian stuff like as a bit of a, just for listeners context, a lot at the beginning and then we'll kind of rework back into your story before touching back on on theology at the end. But obviously people need to know who you are. So uh, what is that? Yeah. So the longer, the longer answer is basically like, you know, as people, there are lots of different things that kind of make up who we are, right? We shouldn't, in a sense, compartmentalize our lives. Um, but there are lots of different things that make us up. So, you know, our passions, our experiences, our hobbies if you were to ask the question who is ben goddard you can look at it from a number of different lenses as you've said i'm i'm a christian and i think that the the most important lens is that you know if god is real which we believe you the listener you may not believe but 
appreciate your patience with me. You know, if God is real, then that's the most important thing there is. You know, he made the world, he made you, and there are huge implications for that. And if he's not real, then, you know, it doesn't matter. But if he is, then this is the most important thing there is. And how we relate to, to him is the most important thing we can do. And being a Christian means being a follower of Jesus of Nazareth. It means, you know, trying to understand the historical Jesus. What was he really like? What does it really mean to follow him? Um, but being a Christian means many other things. It means, you know, Jesus is the son of God. And through being united to him, we too can be, you know, sons of God and have that relationship with God that is deep and profound and brings joy. We're not just sons of God, we're, you know, part of the church, we're part of the family of God. And that means that the way I relate to very literally brothers and sisters at church is is a, a wonderful joy. Um, and it has, it probably has lots of other um, ways in which it cashes out in my life. So that's, you know, one lens. Another lens, you know, I'm a, I'm a son. So grew up my mum which we may talk about later and see my dad around um now and have you know a number of half and step siblings I'm not very good at keeping up to date with everyone but that's another lens on my life another lens is that I'm a medical student final year medical student going to be in the NHS soon which is scary for me and even more terrifying for the NHS and for you the general public so my advice would be find out which hospital I'm going to work at and don't go there so yeah yeah medical student that's another lens on me some of my things that I enjoy, you know, I, I really enjoy theology. Um, I really enjoy Star Wars. It's probably some other lenses as well that I've forgotten, but hopefully that gives you a bit of a picture of me. So the way that you frame who you are in your mind is through different lenses. So there's different ways in which you reveal yourself to different people in different circumstances, or is it just different ways in which someone can can observe you, but then fundamentally you want, as you mentioned at the beginning, for, for Christianity to be the bedrock of that? Well, I think I think it's just at the end of the day, we're all we are individual. We're, we're all individuals. We are people and we all have different relationships with different things in the world around us. And those, in a sense, kind of characterize us. And the way in which we relate to people will, will be, be unique and not just people, but things, you know, the way we relate to things as well. And so I guess what I mean by those lenses are, you know, what does it look like for Ben to re relate to this thing? And, and I think as well, these lenses, you know, they, they overlap, right? Because if it's, if it's just me and we're trying to have a look at me through a, a medical lens, well, you know, I'm still a Christian and that will, you know, influence the way I do medicine. You know, I'm still a son of my mother and, you know, that's probably less likely to influence medicine in the same way, but I'm sure it will in some ways. Um, you know, my love of Star Wars will probably influence the way I, in which I do medicine. Because these, these things all interact because we are just... You know, it's not like there's this bit of Ben and it's completely distinct from this bit of Ben. There's just Ben and he has these different bits which interact. As I mentioned at the beginning, obviously the a primary reason for why I've got you on today is hopefully this will be going around, around Easter time. And I wanted to get your, your take on really for the listeners who maybe have come across Christianity, maybe even went to church as a kid, maybe didn't. And just give a little bit of a, a summary of what Christianity is actually is and why anyone should pay attention to to it in, in the modern world if you were to put christianity in three words the catchphrase is jesus is lord now to really see how that cashes out and what that means you need to understand some of the background um so you know christianity comes out of judaism um ancient jewish belief you know that there is one god who made the world he made a good world he put people in the world to govern it and look after it and humanity rebelled against God, and we turned our backs on him. And to turn your back on the God who is good, who is loving, who is just, that's an awful thing to do. To turn your back on the one who gives you life deserves death. And, and that's what God in his justice does, is he curses the world. And that's why we see all the kind of dark things in the world. It's either human evil or it's God's just punishment on the world, which, which doesn't cash out in a one-to-one -one way of, you know, you you know, you're suffering because you did some bad thing. That's not what's going on. But it's the world as a whole is under God's just punishment. And, so, and But the thing is, because God is love and he really cares about us, he promises that he'll send someone into this world to undo the curse and bring blessing to the whole world. And as you go through the Jewish story, 
the the story of the of the Old Testament part of the Bible, we get that story unfolding, that promise gets clarified. You know, you get Abraham and God says, through your offspring, I'll bless the world. And, and then you go down the line, you get King David, you know, one of the great kings of Israel. And he did some awful stuff, but he was still, you know, one of the better kings. And God promises to him, you know, one of your descendants will be the king forever. And then, you know, you go further down the line, you get some of the prophets and it promises, you know, they, uh, you know, the, pro- the prophets promise that God will send someone into the world through whom God's people will be forgiven of the evil that they've done through suffering and dying and coming back to life. Um, I forgot you get Moses as well earlier on, who was one of the great leaders of the people of Israel and um, and one of the very instrumental figures in, in bringing them out of Egypt um, and into the land. Well, they didn't quite get into the, into the land of Israel under Moses, but he says there will be another prophet like me and he will teach you these things. You need to listen to him. And it's into this story, it's into this story that Jesus of Nazareth is born. And he comes along and says, I'm, you know, he doesn't actually say these words, but, you know, the idea is that he is the fulfillment of all of these promises. And although he might not say the words, you know, I am the fulfillment, he definitely identifies as someone, as as the one who is. And more than that, more than that, as we see in some of the promises, which I didn't mention, he is God come down in the flesh. And, you know, Christians believe in the Trinity. There's one God, one being of God, but within that, Within the one being of God, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's God the Son comes down to be this one. And and you can, you know, read the Gospels, the historical accounts of the life of Jesus. um, And you can, you know, just see the kind of person he is, you know, full of justice and care and love and gentleness. And he can be pretty harsh to the religious leaders, I presume maybe some other people at times, um, when they stand against God, but he comes with this message, you know, of forgiveness to those who turn back to him. Um, he does many miracles, which, you know, as the listener, you may struggle to believe. And, you know, there are different things that can be said about that, but he teaches amazing things as well. And you can read some of his teaching in in the gospels and it, it really cuts to, you, you know, you read this and it's like, man, this is compelling stuff. And then, you know, he was betrayed by his friends uh, to the religious authorities who wanted to kill him and he was killed. And the crazy thing is, is that he was saying that's that's why he came. He came to die. And the Bible teaches that when Jesus died, it wasn't just him being the, the target of an abuse of power. It was also him as God allowing this all to happen. And in his humanity, he dies on the cross, taking the divine punishment for all who turn back to him that we deserve because we all deserve punishment for the evil things we've done and we've sinned against an infinite god an eternal god so the punishment we deserve to be proportional would be eternal and that's what the bible calls hell and you know that's not an easy pill to swallow you know i'm not you know sitting here thinking you know oh yes you know this is great you know fire and brimstone but we have to be real with what jesus said and he said that this was a reality and but he also said that he came and died taking the wrath of God so that if we turn to him, we don't have to. And instead we can be with him forever, living in joy and love with him, this wonderful man. And in the community of people who follow him, who have lives transformed by him. So that's why why Christians celebrate Good Friday. That's why we call it good, even though celebrating the death of, of our God, who, for those who are into technicalities he didn't die in his divinity because god can't die but he died in his humanity and he came back to life and that's what we celebrate on easter and he came back to life and he's now reigning as the king you know he was that promised king he's reigning as that promised king but between his resurrection and his ascension he was seen by a number of witnesses and the first christians were saying look we saw him and then he ascended into heaven and, and the bible says one day he will come again to bring that judgment but also to make the world new And there'll be no more decay, no more disease, no more death. There will just be God and his people, those who turn to him and say, I trust you to forgive me. And until then, he gives them his spirit to come and live in them and to grow them in their relationship with him, to help them to become more like him, you know, full of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and all these things. And to help them help other people as well. Now, I appreciate our monologue for quite a while there. So well done if you made it to the end of this and didn't drop off. Um, 
but that's kind of my summary of Christianity. So what, what does it mean? So how does, how does that tie back to the phrase, Jesus is Lord? Well, he is, you know, in the Old Testament, they used to call God the Lord. So he is God and he is the Lord, the king who came to die to save his rebellious subjects if they would turn back to him. And so the question, it begs the question, will you trust him and will you turn back to him? That's the summary of Christianity. Th- thank you for delving into that summary of, of Christianity. I think it's obviously very helpful for, for the listeners who maybe have come, come, haven't come across it before or have heard disjointed bits from the media or from friends or whatnot. Uh, and one of the questions I wanted to ask off the back of that, which is, I'm sure I know many of my friends may share this kind of view, and you sort of explain the the context, the historical context in which Jesus comes into things and where Christianity is born out of. How do you go from viewing that as a historical lesson of how humans have evolved or come to understand their surroundings and things and make the leap to know this was actually real? Jesus did actually perform miracles. God is real. How do you how do you jump across that gap? Because it's something when I've tried to rationalize and think about at detail, it's a question that I've wrestled with. So yeah, obviously for the listener aren't Christian, it's gonna be that that jump is gonna be the, the, the tricky one. So how would you how would you answer that? Because I I, th- I think as you read through the books of the Bible, it's pretty clear that the authors were like actually meant what they believed and it wasn't just a metaphor for something else you know if you look at particularly the new testament these are letters by church leaders to churches trying to speak into these churches situations where maybe they've got lots of problems going on and saying no no, this is what we believe about jesus and the the, like what it means for us and, and what that like cashes out as spiritual realities you know it's not just it is spiritual, but it transform. It, but it is real. And then, in light of that, what that meant for those churches at that time. Um, so that would be, you know, kind of a lot of the New Testament stuff, the Gospels, so the historical accounts of the life of Jesus that are collected in the Bible. You know, the authors very clearly believed this was true. Um, you know, they write down names of people, places they were. Um, when you compare it to some of the Gospels that weren't included in the Bible, those ones that weren't included in the Bible had like very few names and very few places which means it's more likely it was made up at a later time somewhere else Um, whereas those ones which are included they actually you know bear the marks of something that was written at the time Um, and then it looks like they're writing to persuade people it was true so we can at least say that the authors believe that what they were writing was actually true and wasn't a metaphor for something else. And I, I think that holds for the for the um, Old Testament part of the Bible as well, although the specific way in which it cashes out will be different. So then the question would be, do you find it persuasive? <laughs> you know, do, you, do you actually agree with with uh, with what they're saying? And, and, you know, if you're coming from a place of saying, well, you know, there's absolutely nothing s- supernatural or spiritual about the world, then, you know, you've already written it off and you can't believe that these things are true. You can believe maybe they believed it was true, although you probably have some challenges. Like, why do they believe these, you know, accounts of, you know, large-scale public miracles are true? Um, that's quite hard to explain. But actually, you know, if, if perhaps you have a more open mind and say, well, you know what, actually, you know, I'm not, you know, just going to commit to there being a, a spiritual reality, but I'm, I'm open to the idea that there might be, then actually it shifts the probabilities a lot. And actually, you know, you can look at some of the some of those, for example, you know, large scale public miracles that Jesus, you know, that the the Bible claims Jesus did and say, well, actually, you know, if they're writing to persuade people and it was written, you know, around the time. So people would have been around who saw this kind of stuff. If it didn't happen, then that's like the worst persuasion technique ever. But uh, but. You know, if, if there are these spiritual... Re- I mean, take, for example, the end of Matthew's Gospel. Some people think it's the earliest Gospel that was written. Most modern scholars don't, but throughout history, a lot of people have. Um, it was written by one of Jesus's, uh, you know, first followers, one of the leaders in the church. And, you know, depending on where you date it, some sceptical scholars date it, you know, um, you know, second century, you know. But, you know, I, I do think that sometimes their scepticism isn't warranted. <laughs> Um, and not just because, you know, I'm biased because I'm a believer, I just, I just don't think it's that warranted. And at the end, Jesus was buried, there was a tomb, 
and there were guards put in front of the tomb because they knew the disciples, well, they knew that they thought the disciples would come and steal the body. And it says this, while the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed, and the story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Now, notice what Matthew's doing there is he's responding to an objection that was circulated at the time. Now, the objection wasn't the body's still there in the tomb. The objection was the disciples stole the body, which means it was predicated on the idea that the tomb was empty. So everyone agrees the tomb was empty. So the question is, did the disciples come and steal the body? Now, let's be real. That's the dumbest idea anyone's come up with to try and start a religion. Like, you've got this tomb guarded by Roman soldiers and you're going to try and take him down. <laughs> like, and you're not a soldier. Like, I don't know about you, but like, you know, I'm a five foot ten skinny guy. That's not going to be my plan. The idea that the soldiers were asleep is like a really silly idea as well, because, you know, they, they would have gotten so much trouble. Um, and they, you know, why, if the disciples stole it, why didn't they say the disciples stole the body? You know, so all in all, it seems like a bit of a, a rubbish kind of explanation to say the disciples stole the body. But then, you know, the tomb's empty. And there's not really any other good explanation other than it actually happened. Um which, as we've said, if you if your mind's closed off to a resurrection, you can't believe that. But if you're open-minded to the possibility that it might, then all of a sudden it becomes a lot more plausible. If Jesus really did rose from the dead, then we have to take that very seriously. Why is it that w this one person has come back to life from the dead? Because most people don't. <laughs> you know, I don't think I'm winning any awards for that observation. But, but why is it that it was Jesus? And then at that point, we have to take his teaching seriously and listen to it and wonder, is God endorsing what this man is saying? And, and I think, you know, without going into lots of detail, that's how we can get from the Bible is just a historical text to the Bible is a divinely inspired text. Just a question I, I thought of off the back of that, and it's one of the questions I was going to ask towards the back end of the podcast. But the way that you've described that very sort of logical and deductive and, and, and looking back at the text and going, well... It's, it's almost, uh, what's it, a Sherlock Holmes quote that uh, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And, you know, maybe it's not improbable, but, you, you know, you get the gist of the quote. And it's sort of like going, well, once you open yourself to the possibility of it, that's the first step, as you've mentioned. Then you take a look into it and you find that actually, oh, this actually might be quite likely. And then look at the implications. But one of the questions I was going to ask at the end of the podcast was, to what degree is Christianity a like a, a feeling and an emotion and sort of like a spiritual yearn where like, I mean, I know everyone's probably seen the clips of uh, evangelicals and Pentecostals sort of like shaking on the ground and speaking tongues and stuff, which is, can be quite a, uh, can be quite a stereotype. I feel that versus the like intentional commitment, reading scripture, delving into the theology and being like, Oh, this is true from what I've read rather than this is true from what I've felt. If that makes sense, like where where does where does Christianity sort of fall with that? Because I guess there's probably a lot of confusion around that as well from the outside. This is actually something I've thought a bit about recently, and I think this is probably one of the greatest misconceptions: is what is faith, what is belief, and the Greek word, because the New Testament was written in Greek. The Greek word that's used is uh, pistis. That's the noun and the verb pistuo to believe. Um, and it can mean faith, it can mean belief, it can mean trust. And I think that's the, th the key to understanding it is, do you trust Jesus? And obviously that means you have to believe it's real. But do you trust him? You know, when you read him in, the in, in this, do you, do you obviously believe that he really is the son of God? Do you trust his claims that that's the case? Do you, you know, trust the claims of the, the leaders of the early church that they saw the risen Jesus? Um, do you trust that Jesus is this risen king? But do, more than that, do you trust Jesus to forgive you 
do you trust that's what he was doing when he was dying as he said he was why else would he die i don't know you know in life we trust different people for different reasons so you know you know i i've laid out a very evidential argument for christianity um you know kind of looking at the history some people might say i oh, will look at the archaeology um some people might you know argue from a more um kind of coherence view like it just makes more sense like the christian worldview makes more sense of the world um you know there are prophecies that are made in the old testament it's a unified story which culminates in jesus it um helps explain the beauty and the evil we see in the world in a very profound way that that makes a lot of sense um some people might argue from the uniqueness of christianity you know it's one of the only major world religions that emphasizes grace as the way in which someone can come into relationship with god rather than by doing the stuff like as a christian i want to do the stuff because jesus is lord and it's good to do good things and i want to please god but i'm saved not because i do good things but by trusting him that's unique um you know uh among the major world religions um like pretty unique and there are other things which make christianity unique you know some people might you know look at the bible you know i have a friend who looks at the bible and says you know like this was written by 40 authors or so over you know over a thousand years and it all ties together in such a profound way unlike any other book i've ever read and so that's why he believes in the ultimate author god you know some people might believe from cost benefit analysis if there's no god then everything's meaningless. But if there is God, then there's, you know, an eternity with him or an eternity, you know, under his judgment. So I'd rather be with him in his joy. Um, you know, there are lots of different reasons why people trust God. And, and as you said, for some people, it may be a charismatic experience. Um, but at its root, what is it fun? It's trusting Jesus. Um, and I'm a bit less bothered about why someone trusts Jesus. That, and, you know, for some people that might be a leap in the dark as well. You know, it might be blind faith, but I don't think it necessarily is. What characterises that faith? What is the foundation of that faith? How does that faith cash out? I think it ultimately, I think, you know, the Bible takes a primacy over charismatic experience. Um, so while someone might initially believe from a charismatic experience, at the end of the day, you know, if we're saying we follow the historical Jesus, we actually have to look at the historical texts in the Bible to find out what it means, rather than just kind of this spiritual experiences, these private experiences, which, you know, you know, the skeptic may have a point when they say it might just be you, you know, and, and not actually the real Jesus. That's where ambiguity comes in, where if someone is supposedly feeling something and someone else is saying that God has told them the same but opposite, and neither of those things also reconcile with what the text says, that's where it gets a bit confusing and kind of falls down. And even though, like you say, there there is that open possibility in terms of like prayer and seeing things happen and, and potentially even miracles, although that's a debate within Christianity as, as to like the present day, I think it's it's obviously interesting to hear that regardless of all of that scripture first and regardless of the reason for trusting jesus it is the trust in jesus and that jesus is who he claimed to be is ultimately the the savior as the savior of the world is the only way that you can sort of then come to faith and have your sins sort of like redeemed and i won't go back into it but that's obviously everything you explained at the beginning of the podcast with regards to what sin actually is and how that yeah. sort of works yeah and and i think you know, it's fundamentally baffling. You know, even as I say this now as I reflect, it's like, do you trust Jesus is who he said he is? And do you trust him? You know, do you actually trust him with your life? You know, and I think the answer is like, you know, yeah, he's worth it. I'd love to talk more about this, but in the, in the spirit of the podcast, no pun intended, uh, I'm going to try and embed this story in your own personal story as well and, and hopefully we can towards the end tie it back in to faith and maybe ask a few of those more challenging questions that people might be immediately springing to mind but i do encourage you not to skip forward to that if you're listening because i think it's important to understand how you've come to these views yourself and so uh you know half an hour later than i would in most episodes uh let's let's sort of delve in and, and turn back the pages so 
uh, I'd love to understand a little bit about, more about you, about how you developed mm. your faith. And so if you were to de- describe yourself as a kid, uh, how would you say that's shaped who you are today? I think a caveat I'd give to all of this would be, you know, obviously I've done a lot of thinking about the theology stuff. I've probably done less thinking about how I've got to where I have and what my influences have been, um, particularly at an early age. I guess more recently I have, um, but particularly at an early age. So uh, take what I say with a pinch of salt. I just grew up with my mum. She's a lovely lady, if you ever meet my mum. And I don't think I spend enough time with her. I don't think I'm nearly as grateful as I should be. Um, I don't know if I fully understand the way in which she shaped my life. But yeah, I just grew up with my mum at home. It was just me and mum. Just, yeah, have friends, you know, have a good time. Um, Went to church growing up. I feel like I've thrown you off by like having this deep intellectual discussion then just cutting it to like throw back to your childhood. Sure. So, I mean, we'll jump in at secondary school. So, you know, I went to, went to, pri- well, just went to primary school, had some good friends, went to the church I was at growing up. I kind of went to secondary school and was influenced in a number of different ways by different friends. And perhaps for the first couple of years, maybe I didn't take my faith that seriously. And then kind of I went on a Christian summer camp. Things did start shifting around in my life. I think I consciously remember, you know, hating my sin you know, areas of my life where I'm rebelling against God. That's what sin is, really, you know, the evil actions that we do. And and it was actually at that point where I thought I'd love to do medicine overseas in, in, in less resource-rich places. Um, and I'm not entirely sure what that will look like in the future now. Um, obviously, I'm studying medicine still. And so, you know, I went through school kind of more invested in my faith and... At secondary school, not a lot of my friends were Christians, which is actually what got me into kind of what's called apologetics or like having reasons for the faith that you have. Because essentially I'd have to either, you know, if your friends come at you and say you shouldn't believe it because of this, this and this, you either have to say, oh, yeah, or you have to say, hmm, let me think about that and let me consider some of the other points of view and come back to you. And I mean, you know, something which we may talk about later, you know, from a very young age was struggling with pornography kind of all this time. and, And that was a big thing in my life. Um, and kind of hating what I was doing, but finding that a very difficult thing to, to deal with. And then went to sixth form, uh, kind of closer to where I lived. There was lots of Christians there and the dynamic completely changed. I was really struggling with other Christians and thinking, oh, I have to do the stuff because if I do the stuff, God, it'll make God love me more, you know, um, than these other people. And that's what I really want. You know, that just totally misses the point. Like, it's good to do the stuff, you know, it's good to read the Bible, to learn more about God, it's good to pray, you know, to come to God and, you know, pour your heart out to him. You, you don't earn his love by doing these kind of things. And, and, you know, that's not saying these things don't please him, but, you know, it's, you know, it's not, Christianity is not about earning God's favour. I think that's an important point and probably something that a lot of non-Christians might might get wrong in terms of their perspective of generally of religion. And But I think that's because that's what, you know that's that's what a lot of from my understanding and i'm no expert but from my understanding that's what a lot of other world religions teach do the stuff to get salvation whatever that salvation is and it's kind of how the world works you know work hard you get the stuff and there's something to be said you know god has ordered this world so if you work hard not always but things tend to work better but that's you know, the Bible is emphatically clear. You're not saved by works of the law, by doing the stuff God commands, because no one's done enough. We've all sinned, and that's enough for us to deserve punishment. You know, just think of my day-to-day life. There are so many ways in which I've done evil against people just today. Doing more good stuff doesn't unearn me that punishment. But Jesus taking that punishment for me, that's what solves it. And so trusting him, that's that's what it's all about. And I think that's why people can think, oh, you know, Christianity is just about doing good stuff. And, you know, maybe because, you know, that's people say that, but that's, that's you know, that's really not what's going on. Yeah, and, and one of the questions I wanted to ask is, because you've you've often convicted me of sin in my life, and I've very much appreciated it when when you've been that. Yes, sort of don't like... do that, Zach. I'm go- going to have to tell your mother. <laughs> well, well, not. It's almost the opposite. Of that it's, it's not in a finger wagging way. It's actually, and I was going to mention this. It's always in a way of of 
first reflecting on your own sin and being like, hey man, like, you know, I've struggled with this as well, or I'm currently struggling with this. But as a as a loving brother, I want to just call you out on this because I think you're you're potentially messing up in this regard. And Christians often do get com- like accused of being holier than thou, being overly scrutinizing, overly judging, especially in a world where there's all this thing about not judging and like subjective truths and, and living out how you want without interference from others. Um, but as I mentioned, you've always prefaced it for me that I'm always doing, I'm doing the sin as well, but I'm lovingly trying to like call you out here. And so one of the questions I wanted to ask, hopefully for, for the listener to, to get a sense of an appreciation of where you're at with things is what, what have been the sort of biggest examples of sin internally within your own life? Before I go on to that, I'll just add a quick note, which just to caveat, you know, I think, you know, the Bible does talk about discipline. And not like self-discipline, but, you know, like as a father disciplines his child, you know, it's not pleasant at the time, but it, it really helps, it, you know, no father, you know, wants to discipline their child. You know, they want to, them to be happy, but they do want to discipline in that they want what's best for them. And so, you know, in many regards, the same time, look, you know, as a friend, I really don't think this is the right thing. Um and I care about you a lot, and that's why I'm saying it, and that's why I'm, you know, putting some degree of our friendship on the line, because I really care about you. Um, and there are many ways in which, you know, I struggle with that, and, you know, I find these conversations difficult, not necessarily with you, but, you know, with other people, and maybe that means I hold back. But really, when I hold back, that's not the loving thing to do. And, and you know, there's also other things to say, you know, I don't expect a non-Christian to live like a Christian. I expect a Christian to live like a Christian. Um but I also want the best things for non-Christians, um, which, as a Christian, I believe the Bible sheds light on that. Um, and ultimately, the best thing you can do is follow Jesus. Just to tie through to listeners who may have re- listened to a couple of the podcasts that have gone out before this, is I had a big discussion with Colin about that balance between grace and judgment. And we were talking about, in a secular sense, when you're looking at when you've done something wrong and you're like, oh, no, I've done this bad thing being like the right level of harsh on yourself to then correct it and do good in future rather than people saying oh no it's okay like everyone messes up but then almost being lulled into staying in that in that like almost over forgiving state and what i love about christianity and this has been like a really like compelling point for me is just how perfectly the the balance is struck between like grace and forgiveness and like judgment and like truth like objective truth and how those things like perfectly come together with jesus and as you've obviously described there like it is one of those things that is the most loving thing often to lovingly call someone out of their sin but of course if someone doesn't agree with the the idea of sin and objective truth then it's obviously very difficult and that's how we approach those conversations but I'll, i'll talk about that afterwards that whole that whole space but to uh to embed this back in in your story um in terms of your own sin yeah uh, what's that been like for you there are probably lots of small things it's pretty it's pretty you know if you're listening to this and you're a christian you're probably aware of the big sins in your life or what you what we perceive are the big sins right you know the stuff which which really stands out to us which you know for example for me it was you know watching pornography um from a young age you know the bible is quite clear um that sex is for marriage um, between one man and one woman, which um, you know none of none of what I've just said is popular in today's world, but, but you know that's what Jesus teaches. As a younger, you know, or an older, younger, te- you know, teenager, that was something I I really grappled with because it was something I found myself keep on doing, but really not wanting to do. Um, you know, there's this part of the Bible that talks about, you know, the Christian experience being, you know, ah, oh, I don't, I end up doing what I don't want to do and what I do want to do, I end up not doing and like, what's going on? Um, and, you know, in, in my case, you know, that was a long struggle for a number of years, trying not to do it and keep messing up and, you know, all that. But, and, and you know, my experience is not typical you know so I got baptized when I was 16 and two weeks before I was baptized it just spontaneously stopped I don't really remember it stopping happening um and since then I mean that was what that would be 10 years ago this summer and I've only relapsed properly like twice and that was eight years ago and um and that doesn't mean I don't struggle with lust 
now. And, you know, I think there are many ways in which my exposure to pornography from a very young age has, has really been detrimental to my view of women, which I'm, you know, still working on now, you know, like 10 years later, trying to, you know, really not objectify women and value women um, well. So it's, you know, even though maybe kind of one manifestation is overcome, there are other ways in which I need to grow. And, and you know, that's one of the great things about, you know, the Bible is the Bible says that sin and, you know, sin is this big word, which people don't like. But I think that actually having a right view of sin is really helpful to think, you know, actually sin. What is sin? Someone someone used the analogy, the, the uh, I don't know what the word is, but someone used the acronym shove off God. I'm in charge. No to your rules. I think that's a pretty good way of describing what sin is. And if God's rules are good for us to love him and other people well, then sin is awful. And, you know, like, we can downplay it, but actually lie. I was just thinking about this the other day. Like, no one really cares about lying. You know, we don't really see it. But actually, it's it, it's huge. It's, telling, it's giving someone a view of the world, which is false. And they might make decisions based on that, you know, false view of the world. And, you know, what does it do for how they can trust you? You know, lying is awful. And the Bible says sin isn't just something we do, but our very beings are t- like marred by sin and tainted by sin. So we, you know, the Bible says that humans are made in the image of God, but marred by sin. And and so the reason why we do evil things is because there's evil in us. And, you know, I don't feel like, and, you know, that's everyone. That's Christians as well. That's everyone. And we might not like it, but it makes a lot of sense of our own experience, why we do things that we hate, of the world around us, why there's so much evil. You know, it makes so much sense of the world around us. What the Bible says is that when we become Christians, God sends his spirit to live in us. And day by day, he slowly grows us so we become more and more like Jesus. And one day when Jesus returns, he'll completely deal with the sin in us. But till then, we're grappling and becoming more and more like Jesus. And and that's what I'm really hoping, you know, uh, you know, not just with this area of, you know, lust and stuff, but, you know, generally um, in life, you know, all these areas, you know, lying, um, fear of people rather than, you know, fear of God and trusting him and wanting to obey his rules, you know, selfish ambition, none of that, but instead being humble and, and serving other people. These are the, the, the ways in which I want to grow. And just off the back of that, just to ask one more question on that. Are there any other struggles that you've you faced um, in recent years? Yeah, so... I don't know if I have an official diagnosis, um, but I think it's probably quite clear that throughout my life I've had some OCD. And, you know, I feel like it's something where, you know, when someone just wants something like in line or in order, we often say, oh, yeah, they're a bit OCD. But I think with me, it is probably a bit more, um, you know, on the pathological end of the spectrum um, and probably like actually meeting the proper criteria for it. And, you know, OCD um, is obsessive compulsive disorder. I'm smiling because I I quite like the joke. Someone said I stopped having OCD when I realized it wasn't in alphabetical order. Um, (laughs) But anyway, (laughs) but uh, but it's but it's obsessive compulsive disorder. And so the obsessions are intrusive thoughts. And we all have kind of thoughts which just pop into our mind. And and some of them can be quite negative or quite scary, but we can dismiss them quite quickly. Um, Whereas people who experience OCD, you know, uh, kind of patterns of thinking, they find it harder to dismiss those thoughts. Um, And then there's the compulsions part, which is the behaviours or activities you do to relieve those intrusive thoughts. So classic example might be, you might get particularly anxious about, are your hands clean enough? So I wash my hands too many times, or have I locked the door? And although I've checked it like three times already, I'm going to go check it again. And when I was a kid, I had it quite bad. You know, there would be like, uh, I always need to like wash my hands before I touch my Pokemon cards or, you know, like sometimes on the, the pavement, there's like rough bits and smooth bits and I had to walk on the smooth bits. I think I was kind of better in my teenage years, actually. Um, but then when I was at uni, it started getting pretty bad again. Um, and lo- it would manifest in lots of different ways. The hand washing stuff doesn't get me so much. Checking like locks on doors gets me a little bit, although I've got better the last few weeks. Um, when I'm, you know, doing medicine, I'm scrubbing into theatre, you know, to see some surgery. 
that's something I get quite paranoid about. And, you know, to some extent, that's quite understandable. I don't want to infect someone, you know, when we're cutting into them. So, but I can get quite anxious about that and that can make that quite difficult. But, you know, I, I also think, you know, there are some other ways, you know, there's this thing called scrupulosity, which is like a religious form of OCD. And often it can be like very strong amounts of um, like confession of sin. Um, and, you know, the Bible does say we want to confess our sin, but presumably it doesn't, you know, mean that I need to sit down in a booth with someone and say every wrong thing I've done. Because if that's the case, I'd need to be there for, you know, more time in the day than I'm, you know, actually doing other things. My, my faith is so important. I have lots of questions and I think my OCD is tacked on some of those questions and that is kind of sometimes it's the same questions coming up even though I've thought about it and even though I've thought of a logical response, there can be quite a emotive feeling, a disordered affect um, behind some of the questions which can make it difficult. But I think what I found really encouraging from a you know, well, I think there's a couple of things to be said. One, like, God's given us wisdom, human wisdom for a reason. So, like, I, I have a responsibility to look after my body, have good kind of mental hygiene so that it's going to be, like, optimised. But I think, you know, also, there's this bit at the end of the Bible which says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. And the greatest thing, you know, it's, it's classic with that verse to think, you know, there will be no more suffering. And that will be a beautiful reality because our world is marred with suffering and it is awful. You know, death is a horrible reality. Um. But the best thing is that we'll be with God. And, you know, one of the ways in which I think about it is, is this because there'll be no suffering on that day, there won't be anything getting in the way of my relationship with God. My OCD, as difficult as it will be, it will be gone. And the great thing is that it won't impact my relationship with God anymore. And so I can look forward to that day, the day when everything's made new and I can enjoy God more without these things now, which, which make life a bit more difficult. You mentioned suffering there, and it, it's obviously something that we mentioned earlier on in the podcast about how suffering is intrinsic to being not only a Christian, but being a human because that sin is innate within us and that the whole world has fallen. How does, uh, how does a Christian grapple with the existence of suffering when God is all loving? Like, How can a loving God allow suffering to pierce the world in a way that means that you know maybe people have seen like a stephen fry video where he starts saying that you know children who have like cancer or, or children who there are insects that crawl into their eyes or something like there's there's all these just horrible things i mean very recently we've had another school shooting in america where you know it's deeply saddening how does god allow those things to happen um to to these to these people but just in general like suffering in general there are lots of different ways you can approach this question and i'm immediately tempted to approach it from an intellectual perspective but i do wonder if maybe for the sake of the listener it's more it's better for me to approach it from a pastoral perspective because i imagine there are loads of people who are going to be listening maybe they are going through a really tough time and like understandably a tough time and i don't know to some degree i want to say you know the bible story actually a big part of the bible story is how is god going to deal with suffering the bible talks about how god you know cursed the world at the beginning as a response to human evil that was just and as i want to stress again it's not like because you're suffering you're more worse than anyone else that's not what's going on but the world itself is just that's what decay death and disease are they're outworkings of of living under under god's God's anger at evil, but any individual suffering is just a reflection of the broader state, not of that individual. And the story of the Bible is how God's going to save his people and bring them to that new creation where that won't be the case anymore. And the way in which that happens is through Jesus' suffering, taking on the full wrath of God 
you know, crucifixion was a horrible way to die. There's no denying that. It was just brutal and physically awful. But when we think what was going on spiritually during that time, you know, that is, I mean, that just is hard to comprehend. Jesus taking on the penalty, that is the equivalent of hell for everyone who trusts him, taking that amount of suffering on himself, which he didn't deserve, so that we don't have to face it. And I look at that, and I don't think we can't say that God doesn't love us. But that's what the Bible says. It's precisely when Jesus dies for us, that's when we see how much God loves us. And so that might not, I, you know, that doesn't mean I understand why God permits specific suffering now. And as I said, you know, you know, there are philosophical ways you can think about this and other theological ways you can think about this. But at a very pastoral level, you know, what does this mean for me? Like, again, can you trust Jesus? You know, you might not have all the answers now. But look at the one who says, I am dying under punishment so that if you turn back to me, you don't have to. And that won't answer all your questions. But I think it's enough for us to say I can trust Jesus. And, you know, like, it gives you hope. And, you know, hope in the Bible isn't something which is like, I wish it will happen. Hope in the Bible is something that is, I am certain this is going to happen. And if Jesus' resurrection is true, then your resurrection unto life will be true. And that's a solid hope. A body free of disease and decay and death. A community, a world freed from sin and evil. And the Bible also says that God will use our sufferings to make us more like Jesus. And and that's a wonderful thing. You know, I, I long, the best thing, as I've been saying earlier, you know, the best thing is that we can be made more like Jesus. The good of being like Jesus is so good that maybe the suffering's worth it. You know, I, as I say, completely disattached to your position as the as the listener, right? Yeah, I, I think uh, again, I know I've mentioned Colin before on this. We talked about that grace and judgment conversation, but Colin actually mentioned as an experienced podcaster himself that no matter how many caveats or exceptions that you preface before you make a point you can never truly account for and capture each individual listener's experience when they're tuning in. But I think hopefully as the listener is listening to this or watching this, they can appreciate that we're trying to be as sensitive and, and cover bases as we can, but we have to make general points in, in, in some places. And actually just one of the things I wanted to pick up on there is it's not even necessarily about what you've said, but about what the alternative could be. And when we look at suffering through the lens of different worldviews, You've mentioned the Christian one there, which is compelling for me, both in a rational, which we haven't discussed, but also in, a, in, a, in an emotional sort of like empathetic sense, as, as you've mentioned. But that without God, if, if you take the secular atheist view, then suffering is just stubborn, stupid and pointless. It's just it's just meaningless. It's just suffering with no redemptive possibility. It's just perpetual suffering for for generation on generation and that's just the state of play and and i think it's even though that's not really a case for christianity you can't make the case for christianity purely as an anti case of other things i think it's worth noting because that's probably that's the default position that you may off may actually have if you think about it as a listener if 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 jesus wasn't who he said he was and if atheism is true suffering wins it has the last say because everything ends in death. Whereas if Jesus is real, he bursts through death into everlasting life and joy with God. So we've talked a little about, about your your struggles personally. We've talked a bit about how you've shaped through into uh, when you're like 18, 19 and you took the gap year. And you managed to get into an incredible university after some really, really great A-level results, obviously being very academically driven, as you've mentioned, what was it like being a Christian in an increasingly secular environment that is university, particularly one uh, amongst many that is very, very progressive? Did you have any pushback on your faith? And, and what was it like, not only from from the lecturers and scholars, but also your, your peers and the people you were working alongside? Yeah, I mean, so the way... Just to give you a brief outline of my time at uni, I did the undergrad course, uh, or the undergrad part of the medicine course, then I took a year in, out in the middle, 
um, and then I did the kind of clinical part of the course. Um, and uh, for the year I did in the middle, I, um, I worked for a church. And, and in the undergrad part of the course, you spent the kind of first two years doing medicine and like the sciencey kind of stuff, the basic sciences. And then um, you do a year of something else. Most people do a sciencey thing. I, I actually did theology during that year, and it was great because I've never done less work in my life. But uh, did I receive a lot of pushback in those first three years? Probably not a lot. Um, you know, if I'm honest with you, um, you know, maybe a bit here or there for some, you know, views where I hold to what the Bible says. Um, and, you know, I, I really hope I didn't come across as being someone who held those views, you know, aggressively. That's not to say I wasn't convicted by them or I didn't hold them strongly. But, you know, I, as we, I've said earlier, I really care about people and that's why I hold the views that I hold. Maybe I was less mature, so maybe I did. Um, and if that's the case, that's something I want to repent of. But, you know, I, d I don't think I got a lot of pushback on the whole. Maybe some. I think there was some stuff more of kind of, you know, the new atheism kind of science has disproved God kind of stuff. Um, I think now kind of more progressive places, the pushback against Christianity is more on the moral stuff, you know, like sexuality and gender and things surrounding that. Um, and kind of truth and you know things around that um, but no while I was there as an undergraduate you know it was it was a pretty good time I think since I've been in the clinical school I've kind of received more pushback for some of the views that I hold and that's been quite tough to hear rumors going around which aren't true um, to hear people kind of talking about me behind my back people who have never actually spoken to me as a person maybe they don't understand my views well maybe they think you know i hate people which it isn't true but in in the midst of all that you know i you know i do have a lot of friends um and so that's been encouraging my church has been a wonderful you know support network and i think you know just in all of this just remembering a couple of things like people have always hated christians you know, from the very beginning. So it's not something I shouldn't expect. It's something I should actually consider when calculating, is this whole Christianity thing worth it? But, you know, Jesus is so great. The answer is yes. But, you know, Christians have always suffered. And, and the you know, the idea is that, you know, keep serving people, keep speaking God's word, and ultimately he will rescue you, if not in this life, then when he comes again. Um, and, and also that's true of Jesus. You know, people hated him as well. They killed him because of his teaching but God raised him from the dead and if God can raise him from the dead then God will save me as well so that's just something to keep in mind and I think it's also sorry just another time just like how do I handle pushback you know like people might not like me but you know God's called me to love them um so just keeping that in mind because it can be easy to be like I don't know I mean, how do you strike that balance when you approach someone where potentially they're not they're not a Christian and they don't believe in this objective moral code of conduct? I suppose like there's objective morality on their lives, and you're saying, "Hey, like what I'm seeing you doing there, in terms maybe they're um, sleeping around or hooking up and things, and they're at university. How do you say that's not only wrong?" in just a, I just think it's wrong, it is objectively wrong and, and this is why, in a loving way. Because it again, like we've mentioned before, it can come across as that finger wagging like holy than thou. So how do you how have you like uh, approached that or how would you approach that? Yeah, I mean I don't know if that's a situation I've come across. You know, I think people know what kind of what the Bible says about these things generally, right? People aren't surprised by an orthodox view of sexuality. But and and so I don't think these conversations come up you know as i said earlier if people don't share my worldview i don't expect them to live as if it's true you know there's, there's you know it's just not something that is the case now obviously i'd love them to believe it's true because i think you know i really want people to be with jesus now and forever rather than you know doing things which are harming them now and you know will end up in hell under god's judgment so i'd love people to believe in jesus and i'd love them to live a life following him and you know i think it's a beautiful thing and so that's where the conversation really should be is is you know, ultimately, let's talk about Jesus. And, you know, as part of that, you know, that may be saying, you know, following Jesus means X, Y, and Z. And, you know, if someone was going to do something particularly harmful, I hope I'd have the courage to say, actually, I, you know, 
this particular, you know, I don't hold you to the same standard, but I think this act is particularly um, harmful and, you know, irre irrevocable and irreversible. And so actually maybe, you know, as your friend, I kind of have a duty to say, just think about this for a minute, you know, um, and, you know, hear, hear another perspective because you really can't go back on this one. I don't know if there's, I don't know if I've really answered your question there. I can't um, kind of. I mean, the way in which you've generally conducted yourself and at least convicted me is just in, in grace. I remember being stood at the beach throwing pebbles and you talking to me about whether I'd, I was thinking I was describing a scenario to you and you said, well, do you, do you think you're coming across as graceful there? And even though what I might be saying is true online, at the, you know, at the time three, four, five years ago, I was potentially espousing things which were potentially truthful, but not in a very graceful manner that's potentially just causing more harm than good and just not really being that loving. And I think that's kind of why I asked the question is it because it can be so easy, especially as especially as young men. I see a lot of like fired up young men who are like coming back to Christianity, but doing so in, in, in an unloving and ungraceful way. And that's why I think, you know, it's important that we hold ourselves to these standards and, and try and call those things out, but that we do it in a loving way. And, and actually to, to pick up on one of the things you've mentioned there is that I remember watching a, a video on, on YouTube. Uh, you, you've probably seen it as well from Lutheran satire. And they have a couple of like satirical songs where they basically describe current like moral issues that are going on in culture. And they go, well, why would I entertain this conversation on this specific sin or this specific issue when we don't have, we, when we don't agree on the same preface? And they're like, we'll focus on if you think that Jesus is God or not before we start talking about whether gay people should be allowed to get married, even though that is a conversation that needs to be had, that person isn't going to agree because they aren't following that logic all the way back up to its source, which is that Jesus is God and Jesus speaks with moral authority and this is all of what he said. And so that's what I find particularly compelling now, even though, as you say, you know, it's important to like challenge people and stuff. It's then also looking at how we relate that back to Jesus. And it's not just we want to, you know, have a comprehensive understanding of Jesus because that way you can understand where we're coming from. Although that is part of it. It's ultimately, I want you to have, to, to have a comprehensive understanding of Jesus because he's great. <laughs> and like, it's true. And I want you to believe this and come to him. And all these other things are important and they matter. But the first thing I think I can say this this well. The first thing is just like, do do you accept Jesus? Because that will overspill into all these other ways. But the most important thing is to have Jesus. Because if you have Jesus, it will you know lead to you know all these other you know things and so on. But you can have those things without having Jesus. That's almost the the danger of following the aforementioned. I don't know, Jordan Peterson symbolic way of of kind of ing agreeing in theory that this is the most rational and logical conclusion, but not actually then actually believing it in your heart. And I think that's that's becoming like very legalistic with no trust in in that Jesus said who who he said he was. Uh, I, I want to take this into a couple of directions. One of them is asking you basically what where where you're at personally now and what your plans are but then hopefully just asking a couple of questions that i think the listeners might have um just on some nitty-gritty things about surrounding christianity uh, to maybe maybe dispel doubts or even open questions and hopefully provide a little bit of um a little bit of context for everything but yeah if you first of all in terms of where you're at so you've mentioned that you you've been studying at cambridge and you've had a bit of pushback but you've you've kind of come through that and actually right now as we're speaking you're almost near the end of of, of graduating so first of all congratulations a long and arduous time i'd imagine <laughs> uh apart from the theology year <laughs> yeah. as you as you've mentioned um but yeah how, how are you feeling i've got i think like three or four months left I've got like six weeks of placement. I've got two big exams. You know, God willing, if I don't fail those exams, I'll be starting my job in August. Um, I don't quite know what job I'll have yet. I had to actually submit my ranking this morning. 
um, for like 400 jobs. Um, and I had to rank them all from best to worst. And then I had like, mate, this is a funny story. I had like a last minute panic because it was like this drag and drop thing. And like, you had to scroll to the bottom of the page if you wanted to put it at the bottom, right? In fairness, I probably should have started with the worst and gone up to the top, but I was like, ah, I don't know if I have enough time before the deadline because I've left it really late. And then when I was checking it through, like two of the ones that I put like rank 250 ended up in my top 30. And I have no clue how that happened. So I was like, ah, I need to quickly sort this. And then I don't know if I press save in time. I could be like an hour and a half away from where I want to be. <laughs> like, this is not ideal. But anyway... That's me. Welcome to the NHS. Welcome to your future doctor. No, I, I promised this was an accident and I I, uh, I didn't intend to. So, yeah. And there's something that we briefly touched on earlier, but this is now the kind of intersection, the fuse where moving forward, you're potentially hoping to tie together this medicine and this this theology and this this passion for the gospel and, and, and sharing this with people. Honestly, no clue. Okay, like, you know, I've got some some ideas, right? You know, there are parts of the world which you know don't have as much access to Christianity. I love, I actually love theology, and I know that sounds dumb, but you know, lots of lots of Christians love Jesus, but they don't spend a lot of time thinking deep about their faith. I love that kind of stuff. I think it's fascinating, invigorating, joy giving. Um, I absolutely love it. I love philosophy or kind of thinking about some philosophical stuff, particularly where it overlaps with theology. Um, and, but I, you know, I have enjoyed medicine. I think there's some really good stuff I can do there. Um, how this will all play out, I have no clue. Um, I just know what my next steps are and then a few plans I have after that. And, you know, I do want to be thinking long term. But I also think sometimes it can be good to think, you know, what are the next steps in front of me? Um, what are the options that I have? What are some things which might be like a one year thing, but actually I'll get a lot of gain out of that one year. So maybe it's worth delaying because, you know, I've, I've taken loads of time out. I took like a gap year before uni, a gap year in the middle of uni. I did theology for a year. So who knows? I might be a doctor for another two years and then I'll come back and do like three part time masters or something like who knows? But I want to do stuff that, you know, I enjoy, like the theology stuff. But hopefully this stuff will make me useful as well. You know, like useful for understanding theology more so I can better teach it to other people and help people engage with faith and better understand like medical ethics more um, so I can engage with that and, and things like that. You mentioned choice and you mentioned the options you've got ahead of you. And you mentioned that, you know, you're not sure and you've made these decisions and some of the conversations I've had with people that might be even listening to this are around that choice, the choices that we have and the the free will and the, the illusion of free will and this whole term in Christianity of like predestination. Are we really free to choose? Some Christians take different views on this, but but I'm I'm pretty convinced by the view that I have. Um and I I don't think this is because you know there are some points where we can say and, and this is you know there are some things and these are very minor things where we can say in the bible there's there is legitimate room for when we're applying good interpretation techniques to try and understand what the author was saying there is room for different views there's some stuff where i think there's less room like where, where we're just like it's actually pretty you know when you apply good interpretation rules to try and understand what the author was originally intending it's pretty clear um, and I personally think this stuff is pretty clear. Um, clearly, when you go through, you know, the Bible, there are it, it's stories of real people making real decisions. And that makes sense of our own experience. Like, we make real decisions. You know, it's not like I was forced to do something that I didn't want to do. It's not like my arm just kind of came and you know, picked up this can of, I don't know, Sprite when what I really wanted was Coke, you know. And so it's it's not like God is forcing me to do stuff I don't want to do. But what we would say is, you know, the Bible teaches that God is sovereign and in, of, in charge of everything. But the way that that often works out is through our will. 
So the way in which God is kind of ordering things is through often the natural order of things and, and God's kind of in charge of that. And he can obviously break in. That's, you know, that's what in a sense miracles are. It's God breaking into the natural ordering of things and shaking stuff up. And he can do that. Um, and and that's one of the things the Bible says is that actually that's we need our, our desires and our wills to change. And that's kind of brings us back to what we were saying earlier about the Holy Spirit coming and helping us become more like Jesus. So I don't know if that's a little five minute soundbite. So yes, humans have real decisions and the way in which God is kind of ordering things is that his will works out through our wills. One of the the logical things that, that I think a friend that I've introduced to you before has said is, you know, he just thinks purely just from thinking about cause and effect and the butterfly effect of just something has happened before something. Therefore, even the spontaneous thoughts that we have are only a product of all of the thoughts and experiences that we've had before that were only a product of the other things that people impose onto us, which was impose onto them, like almost infinitely going back. That means that even though we think we're operating spontaneously with choice, with freedom, I'm moving my hands around, you are listening to the, or watching to the podcast right now on your phone, on the computer, in the car radio, wherever it may be right at this moment, was always going to happen because everything is like a domino effect. And obviously that's like just purely thinking, like not not in terms of like God in the equation. But when you put God in the equation, I think that starts to make more sense. Mm. Tell me more. Well, I mean, just because... See, I'm asking the questions now. Yeah. <laughs> you've, you've flipped the switch. Um, like, when... Without God in that equation, for me, if everything is a product of what's come before, and you obviously follow that to the logical, like, nth degree of where that begins, the fact that there is a begins implies that someone has external from that time has be started it and obviously scientists debate over like whether the universe was infinitely in the past and there was like like the big bang and before that there was universes before that and there's obviously a discussion around that but to me i would say that time must have started at some point to start the like uh cause and effect because otherwise you could just infinitely go back into the past with cause and effect and I don't know, to me that doesn't, like, I can't comprehend infinity into the past indefinitely with nothing that created that infinity, if that makes sense. Like, that just doesn't... Sure, yeah. Um, and I feel like there probably are some philosophical arguments for the existence of God from that. Um, yeah. But, yeah. But yeah, I guess so. that takes the conversation down a different route. So, yeah, yeah, I feel like there are, there are so many contentious things that we could sort of, like, sprout off into that I think not only would be, uh, like interesting for us to discuss just us two but like interesting for the listeners to hear about as well as, especially as christianity comes up against a lot of uh as we, as we as we've like danced around so far in the podcast a lot of like culturally contentious issues where people say it's you know my way and my truth and uh, and it's so far from what the bible says which is that there are these objective standards and that we should yeah. try and stick to this and yeah i mean it's like I mean, the classic thing is like Disney says, follow your heart, right? But Jesus says, deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. You know, Disney says, you are the king of your life. Jesus says, no, I am. And that's an outrageous claim if it's not true. But if it is true, then we've got to ask, is he a good king? And if he is, and is he a better king than I am? And I can definitely say that that in my life is true um <laughs> yeah uh, yeah so that's a great way of putting it uh, i'm sure you didn't come up with it <laughs> no no i stole that from someone else yeah. <laughs> or parts of it i stole yeah yeah, yeah. um but like i, I kind of want to as much as we could sprout off into loads of different discussions around that i kind of want to look at from the perspective of someone who's listening to this who's who's again as i mentioned coming across christianity maybe at the first or the second time not really trying to understand it is someone who is agnostic or atheist or someone from another religion is listening to this how do they approach and make sense of christianity given what you've said like what are how does someone begin to form a quote-unquote relationship with god or read the bible or attend church or get plugged in like what are the 
practical steps if someone's gone oh actually you know that's, that's really wrong true that i actually you know i have thought about that before and maybe it could be true like what what, what do they do from that point yeah so i mean jesus says he's recorded a saying in in john's gospel i am the way the truth and the life no one comes to the father except through me so if you want to know god you've got to get to know jesus and obviously as we said in the trinity jesus is god come down to reveal himself to us in the flesh and so what i would say is you know read these accounts of the life of jesus for yourself you can get them for free online just type in you know bible john esv or niv or something like that right the three letters were different translations because obviously it's only in greek just read it see what you make of it write down your questions think about it try and think you know you can you know some sermons i quite like uh, desiringgod.org really good guy john piper um yeah good guy and he he's great maybe listen to some of his sermons find a, a good local church that teaches from the bible well um you know there are lots of churches out there not all of them kind of you know take the bible at surface value um find one that does um i don't know the best way to signpost you to that i feel like there's this thing called christianity explored it's um it's like a seven week course like one evening a week and churches often run that to like ex- help people explore christianity see more about jesus so they have a website um it's probably christianityexplored.org or something like that i don't know but you can just you know go on there find it and find a church that's running it and if they're and i find that churches that run christianity explored tend to be quite hot on reading the bible um at surface value and really taking it for what it means um so yeah, read the Bible, get around people who also want to, you know, follow Jesus and really see what he has to say about things. Pray, you know, prayer isn't anything fancy. It's like, you know, I'm talking to Zach, but kind of you, the listener right now, and I don't know what you're thinking or what you're going to say back, but I'm still talking to you. And I still know you're listening. And if God's real, then I can talk to him and I know he's listening. And though I might not hear a charismatic experience of a voice coming back, if the Bible's true, then I know God's listening. And if the Bible's true, I know that that's God revealing himself to us in these words. So in a sense, that kind of is God talking back and trying to understand what, what, what is the author, what is the original author saying to the original audience? How's this point me to Jesus? And then in light of the context that I'm in now, how do I apply my life to this? Not, you know, chopping and changing it because I don't really like that bit, but saying, no, no, what's the underlying principle here? And and how do I mould my life around that? Those would be some of my steps. Read the Bible, pray, find a good church and ask your questions. Please ask your questions because that's what you should be doing, you know, grappling with these things, you know, that's that's how we grow. It's, well, one of the ways in which we grow is by asking questions. And- you're, you're allowed to try and grapple things especially things that you may have doubts over and it's a pretty it can be a pretty scary thing to like comprehend at like the deepest level of like what this actually means if true and then read it and you know it's and i understand that because we live in such a culture that is so far removed from even opening the door to this kind of thing it means that it seems so separated from where we live day to day, where everything is just about the material, what's in front of us with career progression or who's dating who or how we can scale up our side hustle. And it's like, do like how much do these things actually matter in the context of eternity if there is eternity? And that's a question that I've asked myself. And I could, well, it's not that I've asked it, I, I continually ask it and I continue praying to it. Because even with this podcast, you know can 100 become an idol it can become self-gratifying where i'm like look at what i'm saying and i do really want to encourage people to 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 look into this and just to provide a bit of a counterbalance to that and i'm not saying as a counterbalance to the idea that christianity is the most important thing you know like i believe if god is real it is the most important thing but just to give a counterbalance to like it's not just that the spiritual realities are like fundamentally eternal and therefore more important But if God made a physical world, then the physical things we do matter as well. Like how we spend our time matters. And like, you know, me being a doctor actually matters. You know, people's bodies are important. 
and good health is important and like you know productivity god made a world in which we're meant to be productive so actually having a side business as long as you're not doing anything evil like that's a good thing you know like making coffee for people if that's your business that's great like coffee is a good thing that god made and that's a really cool business to have or like an ice cream business or maybe like you know short stories that people can enjoy you know again depending on what the stories are that you're telling but do you get what i mean like these are these are good we, we live in a world full of good things and there are so many ways in which we can be productive and that's a really good thing we can do for god but i guess the counterbalance to that is don't let the now make you forget about the forever i think i'm gonna wrap up there okay. i th- I think that's a a great way to to finish i think you know what if there are more challenging like particular issues that we want to delve into potentially we, we can talk about them on our afro episode but well, i I'll think your first return guest there you go well actually i'm 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 really sorry i'm really sorry to burst oh, your bubble, no, there no, has already been a, a return no. guest um tom portsmouth if you're listening <laughs> technically i'm your return guest because we tried recording this one it was <laughs> yeah. awful, so. well i didn't think we were going to mention that then I <laughs> this definitely wasn't meant to be like episode seven <laughs> and now what is this like 32 or something <laughs> like half a year later ah uh, we've been busy it's all right uh, but i think it's good because it comes at the right time yeah. i think you know the production is better your story is mm. you know it's more up to date <laughs> it's more I polished suppose. as well like honestly last time when we tried to do this it was awful but i think Sorry, hopefully <laughs> overall this is a story that people can can really meditate on and like really chew on and really think about because it means so much for us or it means nothing at all but i think the fact that it means a lot for so many people invites the question why and hopefully that that curious that, that curiosity and that heart to to yearn why you know is there something more than the identity i'm placing in these worldly things why am i always feeling convicted in this thing all of these questions that we might be having um it's worth exploring and i think you've done a hopefully done a, a great great job for for people to open the door to that and open those conversations um but as i said you know there are lots of things we could have talked about that i've got listed here but you know i think what we have talked about is um hopefully useful for anyone listening the thing i was going to ask at the end was how can people get in touch but your response last time was that people should just get in touch with me yeah. so feel free to dm me uh on instagram or or if you have my number on whatsapp or wherever you're listening to this just search up my name and you should be able to find me uh and i'll kind of forward any like particular questions on on your way if i think that um it would be useful to connect but um yeah i mean you know if they're if they're just more you know intellectual questions and it's it's not that deep then you know i might just reply with some kind of link to someone who can answer the question better than i can yeah, yeah. No, I, I I appreciate your time. I appreciate this is the second time coming on. Uh, I don't appreciate the amount of editing I'm going to have to do. <laughs> but I think a lot of that is self-imposed. So, you know, I'm pointing the finger back towards myself. Yeah, no, it's okay. Um, Please point it It's all me. good fun. I, I enjoy yeah, it. And yeah, it's I've enjoyed recording hours. this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so this, you know, we're, we might have pressed record six hours ago, but at least we're finished now. Um <laughs> The only other thing I was going to say is a lot of good and a lot of bad on YouTube, and one of the bad things is your podcast. Now, thanks for having me on, Zach, and it's uh, it's been a really fun time. I've had a good time with you, and and you know, my hope and my prayer, you know, beforehand was that this would be beneficial for everyone who listens. So, um, yeah, yeah, all the all the best to all of you listeners, and uh, well, I obviously think the best is is found in Jesus, but uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, hope you hope you have a good day. Or evening, depending on when you're listening. Or morning. That's part of the day. So is the evening. But it's coming towards the night. Yeah, but more. The, but the morning is from the night to the day. Yeah, so it makes, it's appropriate to say, I hope you have a good day. Because the day's about to come. In the evening, the day's just passed. <sighs> I'm not sure about that one. (laughs) (laughs) These are the kind of discussions that will like spend 20 minutes on like, 
understanding like the epistemology of like the the language used. Yeah, and, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. English categorizations. <clears throat> but anyway, um, presuming cool. that we're over there, um, 